Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining. We've got people just coming in, so we're going to give it just a minute. Thanks for taking your lunch hour to hear about the history of music in Jacksonville. We have like 150 years here to go over, so <laughs> you'll be hearing a, a lot about that in just a little while for, from an esteemed panel. Still just got some people trickling in, so we'll, we'll just wait just a, just, a, just a second or two longer. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started? Some people can go ahead and continue to trickle in, but um, just wanted to say good afternoon. And uh, again, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm Katie Ensign, and I'm Vice President for Placemaking and Administration at the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund, and really delighted to welcome you to, this is the third of a series of six webinars in 2021. We also had a webinar in 2020. Um, this is part of a Jacksonville History and Heritage series that we are putting on to help us all understand our, our roots and our history and our heritage here in Jacksonville. We have partnered with uh, Ennis Davis and the, the Jackson on this project to create it and deliver this series. So we're very, very thankful to Ennis and the Jackson. And for those of you that are not familiar with the Jackson, it's a multimedia project and it's dedicated to urbanism and culture on, <clears throat> excuse me, our first coast. And uh, it is, it we really focuses on urbanism at the hyper local level. And so Ennis and the Jackson are obviously perfect partners for this. Um, and for those of you that don't know Ennis, he's a certified uh, senior planner and author of several award-winning books, including Reclaiming Jacksonville, The Coen Brothers, The Big Store, and Images of Modern America, Jacksonville. Um, so again, we're, he's very interested in historic preservation and all things aligned with urban um, history and heritage. So we're delighted to have you, Ennis. And um, today we are going to be focusing on Jacksonville's musical heritage. Um, influence of neighborhoods like La Villa and, and also the future of the Jacksonville music scene, which is really very alive and well. And you'll be hearing from these um, esteemed panelists in just a minute, I'll turn it over to, to Ennis. But I just wanted to quickly, a couple of housekeeping duties, just wanted to uh, let you know that this is being recorded. So you can um, share it, uh, view it again and share it with all your, with all your buddies. Um, so we'll make sure to get this recording to you. If you could use the Q&A box for questions, we'll be taking questions at the end. And so if you'll share your questions in the Q&A box and use the chat box for any technical assistance that you may need. And uh, again, wanna thank you for being here and Ennis, it's all yours. All right, thank you, uh, Katie. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, so let's get started. So Jacksonville is a city that is rich in heritage, history, and culture. The country that we call home today would not be what it is without Jacksonville's influence and contributions. Nowhere is this more evident than the local music scene. Emerging as a late 19th century seaport and railroad center, an early multicultural community would form and lead to a fusion of new sounds and genres that continue to transform society today. Home to a large black community following the Civil War, the city became a regional vaudeville and ragtime destination for big acts of the era, including the Whitman Sisters, Billy Kersans, and the Silas Green uh, Minstrel Show. Playing a significant influence on the talents of brothers James Weldon and John Roseman Johnson, it was this local scene where the brothers wrote and composed what is now known as the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing in 1900. However, a nearby neighbor, Patrick Henry Chappelle, would help foster an environment that would eventually lead to the community of La Villa becoming a dom dominant entertainment destination. The son of a former Gullah enslaved um, 
family who came to town as construction laborers, Chapel Chappelle opened the first black owned theater in the South in La Villa's red light district in 1898. Two years later, a banjo player, guitar and piano player himself, Chappelle also established the first black owned and operated traveling vaudeville show, the Rabbit's Foot Company. Headquartered in La Villa, this company would become the largest employer of black entertainers and musicians in the country, earning Chappelle the description of being called the Black P.T. Barnum. This scene would play a significant role in early careers of many well-known black entertainers and musicians, including Ma Rainey, who was known as the mother of blues, Jelly Roll Morton, who was the self-proclaimed father of jazz, uh, Blind Blake, the king of finger picking guitar, Zora Neale Hurston and Frankie Madden, who eventually became the father of the Lindy Hop dance. A major highlight took place at the corner of Broad and Ashley Streets when the first published account of blues singing on the public stage occurred at the Colored Air Dome on April the 16th, 1910. The age of Black Enlightenment experience locally emerged internationally due to the Great Migration. Due to economic conditions and Jim Crow laws, many sons and daughters of our community flocked to northern cities, such as New York and Chicago. In fact, Augusta Savage, James Weldon Johnson, John Roseman Johnson, Gerald Neal Hurston, and A. Philip Randolph are among Jacksons who all relocated to Harlem and became key figures in what is now known as the Harlem Renaissance. So instead of referring to ourselves as the Harlem in the South, perhaps Harlem should be called La Villa of the North. Most likely don't realize it, but that the Chitlin Circuit actually originated out of Jacksonville. The Chitlin Circuit was a collective name given to a series of black owned nightclubs, dance halls, juke joints, theaters, and other venues that were safe and acceptable for African-American entertainers to perform during segregation. Walter Barnes, a Chicago jazz musician is credited with being an early originator of the circuit during the 1930s. Successfully establishing a network of venues across the American South, Barnes set up his winter headquarters in Jacksonville to conduct annual late fall to spring Southern tours, contracts, routes, and promotions through his position at the Chicago Defender. Despite an early death, his success encouraged numerous acts to follow the circuit across the South during segregation. At the same time, popularity of jazz, blues, rhythm and blues began to cross racial lines, leading to the emergence of rock and roll. Locally, due to his provocative hip gyrations, Elvis was almost arrested when he came to Jacksonville to perform at the Florida Theater in 1956. It was also our music scene that would play a major role in the fight for civil rights. It was here in 1952 when Mary Anderson refused to sing in front of a segregated audience, making her concert the first in modern Florida to be formed in front of an integrated audience. 14 years later, the Beatles required the singing during their only performance in Florida. In addition, Jacksonville musicians such as Charlie Haas Singleton and Ray Charles would also play a significant role with Singleton finding a way to own his own music and Charles successfully bringing undiluted black music to mass white audiences across the country. Developed from blues, country music and rock and roll, Southern rock would become the next genre to take the city and nation by storm. Affiliated with a number of West Side sites and downtown spots such as the Comet Book Club, Paulus Music Company and the Duval County Armory, Fans associated with Jacksonville include Leonard Skinner, the Allman Brothers, 38 Special, Molly Hatchet, and Blackfoot. While Miami's two live crew played a key role in popularizing the Miami bass scene in the 1980s and early 1990s, it would be Jacksonville acts such as 95 South, 69 Boys, Quad City DJs, Bigger Rankin, and the Cool Running DJs that will put the genre and other forms of reggae and hip hop into Main Street America with hits like Whoop There It Is, Come and Ride It, Space Jam, and Tootsie Roll. During the 1990s, places like the Milk Bar, Moto Lounge, and Paradome offered up a steady diet of punk rock, 
hip hop, reggae, techno, goth, house, grunge, and even Latinites presided by DJ Jose De La Rosa. Acts associated with these former downtown venues include White Zombie, Ice-T, De La Soul, Ludacris, Trick Daddy, and Jacksonville's own Limp Biscuit. From, Jackson, from the Jacksonville Symphony to a nationally emerging rap scene, Jacksonville continues to be a hotbed of musical talents and taste. While it is impossible, impossible to give our music history and heritage its proper due within a 10 minute PowerPoint presentation. So please forgive me for stories and artists that were not mentioned. With this in mind, we are honored to have you join us today for this virtual conversation about various aspects of Jacksonville's rich music history and heritage. This conversation is the third of the Jacksonville History and Heritage Series co-produced by myself and the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund. As an urban planner and co-founder of the Jackson Magazine, I'll be your moderator today. And I'm honored to be joined today by three great panelists. Mitch Herman, a senior archivist with the Jacksonville Historical Society, Warner Singleton, the CEO of War Scene Music, and Tony Steve, an artist in residence of contemporary and world music at Jacksonville University. Each panelist will share their reflections on diverse aspects of our music history that have and continue to play a role in shaping the region and city that we know and love today. Following this, we will close this event with a Q&A session. And so feel free to use the chat room as Katie has mentioned to post your questions and comments for the panelists to answer. Our first panelist is Mitch Herman. Mitch has a background in archives and music museum administration. He received a certificate of archival practice and theory at the Modern Archives Institute at the National Archives and Records Administration in the Library of Congress in Washington, DC. He has managed corporate archives for the Esther Lauder companies in New York City and has worked in membership and development of the Frisk Fine Art Museum in Nashville, Tennessee. In Jacksonville, he served on the board of directors for Norman Studios, Silent Film Museum, and has chaired his archives committee. He is currently the senior archivist at the Jacksonville Historical Society so with that said, I'm gonna turn things over to Mitch. Okay, thank you, Ennis. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm the senior archivist over at the Jacksonville Historical Society. Um, before I begin, I guess um, a lot of this research that I've been doing and we've been doing at the JHS has to do with um, developing a music history museum uh, that we're working on currently now that, that we plan to open up in the old Florida Casket Factory building on Duval Street. Uh, it's led to a lot of research and collections management policies and all that. So, so um, this is the type of music we wanna celebrate. We want, there's a lot of interesting local music, uh, all types of genres of, of very diverse tastes here in, in the, the, the region. And um, we're hoping to celebrate that at that museum when we open it up. So you can go to jackshistory.org and, and learn more about that. I'm going to share my screen here and uh, try to cover about 100 years of history in uh, 10 minutes. <laughs> Actually, um, I'll, dig, I'll dig a little deeper into uh, the blues portion of what, what, uh, what Ennis was talking about here. Um, so uh, there, the, there's very fertile soil in, in Northeast Florida in this region when it comes to the the origins really of uh, blues music and, and also just American music really and, and where it all started. Um, this quote here uh, from folklorist Alan Lomax, the Georgia sea, sea Islands are the home of American song. Uh, what he's basically referring to uh, with that quote is uh, where all of these traditions started, which was uh, the Gullah Geechee and all along the Gullah Geechee Heritage Corridor, which runs from the Carolinas all the way down into Jacksonville and a little beyond into St. Augustine. Um, these are the descendants of the formerly enslaved who were brought here from uh, West, um, West Africa and Central Africa. Uh, and um, those traditions are kind of where a lot of this starts from really. Uh, they brought their own traditions with them, of course, and they work to keep those traditions alive uh, 
here in America, uh, this meant they had their own sort of praise houses and, and what, the, what were, was referred to as ring shouts, uh, spirituals basically, and um, a certain tradition that they had culturally, uh, which involves circling around and, and beating on the ground with a stick and, and, and their own sort of musical traditions. Uh, those traditions are kept alive today by, uh, by the, the Gullah Geechee communities that still thrive uh, all along the corridor. And um, another thing that started early on was the instrumentation also had African origins um, and also parts of the Caribbean. Uh, you see some crude early instruments here. Uh, they went by different names like um, Banya or Abanja. And you know, it, as you can probably hear, it, it all resembles the name banjo, uh, which also has those origins uh, in Africa. Uh, these were the earliest instruments really that started uh, being played in this type of music as it was being formed. The guitar wasn't really a prominent instrument. Uh, a lot of banjos, fiddle uh, players. Um, that was at the time, uh, the late 1800s after emancipation, th this was really the, the type of instruments that were predominantly being used. Uh, Zora Neale Hurston, uh, this is a really great quote about work songs essentially. Uh, here at the end, she says, wherever work is monotonous, uh, singing lightens the drudgery. <clears throat> and she did a great deal of research on, uh, on work songs uh, through other states and, and, and also Florida here as well. Um, this is a good time to remember that basically this nation was built upon uh, the Afri African Americans, the enslaved who came here, uh, paid with the blood, sweat and tears of the enslaved and, and underpaid African Americans over many, many years. Uh, and of course, with that sort of, you get music, of course, and, and, and there were other, there are reasons for that, of course, to lighten the load as, as uh, Zora said, um, also, rhythm was very important when you were doing work. Uh, it was a good way to stay in the same sort of pattern and uh, move things along and get the work done that way. So we have uh, this here, uh, this image on the right is um, actually the, at the, the base of Hogan Street, the docks at Hogan Street. Uh, we've got over here again, turpentine, other industries here in the region. And uh, of course, work songs developed out of that. Um, here's a family out of Fort George Island. Um, that a lot of, the, a lot of um, formerly enslaved people continue to live uh, there on the plantation, uh, the Kingsley Plantation, and, and work uh, and continue to work there. Um, so this is probably the 1870s, I think, um, a photograph here. Um, so in 1884, we, we got this area got a very interesting visitor uh, in the English composer Frederick Delius. Um, he was pretty young at the time. This is a photo of him then on the left. And uh, his father actually wanted him to join the, uh, the family business, which was in wool. They were in the wool industry, but he really just cared about music, kind of directionless. Uh, and his father owned a plantation, an orange grove here, uh, about 35 miles from here up the St. John's River, west of St. Augustine. Uh, it was called Solano Grove. And uh, he had a, a, a cottage there as well. And he sent his uh, son to sort of straighten him out, I guess, and hopefully he could join the family business. Well, it, the whole plan backfired. <laughs> he, he spent his time there really just plucking away at the piano and smoking his pipe on the front porch. And, and, um, but something really interesting did happen for him there creative, uh, creatively. Uh, he, he began to... Um, open up more and become more influenced uh, by other, other sort of influences uh, in his music uh, here in Florida. And that had to do with a lot of what he heard in nature, what he heard along the river. Um, but primarily uh, it was the music he was hearing uh, from the formerly enslaved people who worked for him there on the plantation. Um, the, uh, the house uh, at the time when it, where it stood at uh, Solano Grove uh, here's an image of it here. It was moved eventually to uh, Jacksonville University. It was moved actually piece by piece. Uh, all the pieces were numbered and, and moved. It was actually the Southern Moving Company at the time that moved it in 1960 to JU uh, and reassembled it. Um, what Delius was, uh, was hearing down there though was, uh, he, well, in particular, he had a foreman by the name of Albert Anderson and his wife, Eliza. And uh, they sang a lot for him. He heard them singing. 
Um, he was, Delius was a curious guy. He, um, he, he, he liked to cook his own meals. He, he didn't really, he wasn't much of a boss, really. I think they probably were pretty perplexed by him. Um, luckily, uh, there was a young girl, uh, she was about eight at the time, Eliza Anderson's younger sister, Julia Sanks, uh, who also remembered experiences with Delius there and uh, was living in the 1960s. She was tracked down in West St. Augustine by a, a writer named Gloria Jehoda, and she was able to talk to her about her experiences there. So she just did share with her, um, what she mainly shared with her was that Delius was an atheist, and uh, which we all know, and, uh, uh, and apparently a lot of their time was spent trying to save him. So usually what they decided to sing for him were spirituals and, what, and whatnot. Um, but this, this music heavily influenced him. Here is uh, Koanga, which is a, um, an opera he wrote uh, about slavery, about plantation life in Mississippi. Um, there's like librettos and things here. These are all in the JU archives. They have a really impressive Delius collection uh, there. We have a James Weldon Johnson here talking about, again, the blues is really the, 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 the purest form of American music. Uh, uh, Ennis talked about Pat Chappelle a little bit. Uh, yeah, he was born here in Jacksonville in 1869. He played guitar. Uh, he was always in entertainment. Um, and he started uh, A Rabbit's Foot uh, around the turn of the century. Uh, for what he did open before this was a, was a place called um, Excelsior Hall on Bridge Street, what's now Broad Street in La Villa. And uh, it was really, it was a 500 seater. It was a saloon and a music venue and uh, believed to be one of the first black owned theaters in the South um, at that time. The interesting thing about Excelsior Hall and his, he wasn't there for very long. Um, he had a, a, a rocky relationship with his landlord who happened to be the mayor, Jet Bowden. Uh, so Jet Bowden was his uh, landlord and um, he eventually, I think, evicted him. I did learn recently that uh, Chappelle uh, sued Jet Bowden for, I believe, $10,000. Uh, they had, a, they had a, a bit of a lawsuit over a tile floor that uh, Pat, Patrick Chappelle had installed himself into the theater. And so when he moved out of the space, he took the entire floor with him uh, that he had paid for, this tile floor. And Bowden said, you know, no way. And, and uh, that went back and forth and it led to a lawsuit actually. Um, so yes, Rabbit's Foot, uh, this was really the first black owned um, traveling vaudeville show that came, that started out of Jacksonville here. Um, Gertrude Pritchett was one of many, many uh, well-known performers who worked in the cast uh, with, uh, with Rabbit's Foot. It was a, it was a, it was a pretty uh, impressive um, cast and show actually is one of the best around, known to be one of the best around. Um, many people, as Dennis said, many people know uh, Gertrude as uh, somebody else uh, who went on to become Ma Rainey, uh, the mother of the blues. And she really got her start early on with, um, with Rabbit's Foot. Uh, here she is, I believe in Atlanta <clears throat> with a band. Uh, another big influence that came down and made its way into Jacksonville is the, what's known as the Piedmont sound when it comes to blues. A lot of people with the blues think of uh, the Mississippi Delta uh, and that type of sound. Uh, there was a different sound being produced uh, in this region here on this map uh, that uh, it was a little more ragtimey, um, a little more full chords, different types of melodies and rhythms uh, that eventually became what was known as uh, Piedmont blues, a style of blues. Um, what I find interesting, I'm no music musicologist or anything like that but when i do a when i do a comparison with the Gullah Geechee heritage corridor here along along the coast and the sea islands it really kind of runs parallel in a way right along with the piedmont region which i think there's probably some some trading and swapping going back and forth with musical traditions and different things like that i think there was an influence there uh, and of course it all comes down here towards the bottom into jacksonville uh, which you know, which brings us to La Villa and uh, where all this music was coming from and sort of landing in this real hotbed of, um, of amazing music. Uh, and uh, one, of those, one of those places there along Ashley Street, uh, uh, Ennis mentioned the Colored Air Dome earlier where the, where the blues was first, blue, first blues performance was mentioned. Same building right here um, became the Hollywood Music Store uh, run by Joe Higdon, who's here on the right. And um, 
it's believed, I haven't been able to prove this, but it's believed that Joe Higdon was actually a, um, a scout for, uh, for Paramount Records. So there were a lot of interesting artists in La Villa that, uh, that signed with Paramount Records in Chicago. And it's kind of like, how, did, how would anybody know these people were here? Uh, I've heard from people that it's possible that Joe Higdon was actually a scout as well for some of these artists. And he would have worked here with Ink Williams who was with Paramount Records with their race division and signed a lot of these artists. Artists like Coot Grant and Kid Wilson, uh, her real name was Leola Wilson, and, Wes and he was Wesley Wilson. Uh, they were a popular duo, and they recorded Ashley Street Blues for Paramount, of course, about Ashley Street here in Jacksonville. Uh, and uh, a little known, uh, an unknown guitarist at the time, it was his first recording, backing them on guitar, uh, is Blind Blake. Uh, he uh, was from Newport uh, News, Virginia, originally, I think 1896 he was born. He traveled around uh, and, and lived here on and off in Jacksonville and was known to winter here in Jacksonville, even when he signed with Paramount because he kept an apartment as well up in Chicago. Um, <clears throat> an interesting song that he recorded, he recorded many songs, 80 or so songs for Paramount. Uh, Stonewall Street Blues is one that I love. And it's interesting because when, when I trace his, where he lived around here, uh, he does show up on occasion uh, living on Stonewall Street in Brooklyn which is the corner, it's actually on the corner of Stonewall and Park. Uh, and so when you listen to the song, you kind of understand, wow, he probably, it's likely he at least wrote the song in this house. Um, and what's interesting about it to consider is that that where he lived is basically, you're, right here you're seeing the viaduct that runs across uh, at Jacksonville Terminal, uh, sometimes known as the Lee Street Viaduct, sometimes the Park Street Viaduct. Uh, the opposite side of this viaduct is where he basically lived. So it's interesting to consider when he was blind, he could have literally stepped out of his home, grabbed a rail and just followed it all the way to the terminal, which would have gotten eventually to Chicago, uh, where he did a lot of recording for Paramount. Uh, there's a big cultural shift mid-century when it comes to the blues. Um, and uh, Sam Phillips as well. Uh, Sam was the one at Sun Records who had this, this idea, oh, I've, if I could just get a white artist to record black music, I would be a millionaire. And he saw that in Elvis. Um, Elvis one day was messing around with a, uh, an old uh, Arthur Crudup song called That's All Right Mama, and which he recorded in 1947. Uh, they laid it down at Sun in 1954 and it became a pretty big hit for him. Uh, and um, what was interesting about it then at the time, there was a big scare, of course, about uh, race music or black music at that time. Um, actually, when Sam Phillips sent the record to the local station in Memphis, uh, the DJ played it, I think, at least 14 times in a row. And it kept getting both phone calls for hate and, and like hateful phone calls, turn, turn, you know, take that off the air and other people who just had to hear more of it. Uh, so he eventually got Elvis in and interviewed him. And, and on the sly, what, what he, one of the questions he first asked him was, what school did he go to? Instead of asking him what his race was, because he was on the air, he asked him what school he went to. And that way the listeners understood, was he black or was he white? It was kind of a slick way of, of determining that about Elvis. Um, but, you know, he was still kind of a, a up and coming. And uh, he had, uh, he played Florida a lot. Uh, in 1955, he played... Uh, here in Jacksonville, and it's no what is what many people know to be the first Elvis riot, and uh, and uh, this woman here, May Axton, found him uh, after he had told the girls he could meet him backstage, and then they basically chased him backstage into the into the dressing areas and tore his clothes off and everything. Uh, May Axton, uh, not May Axton, I'm sorry, Artist Bell, I misspoke. Artist Bell found him under the bleachers eating ice from a cooler and uh, took these pictures with him. And here she is. She actually decided uh, a few years ago to, to donate those photographs, those original prints to the Jacksonville Historical Society. Uh, while he was here, Elvis got connected with Mae Axton who lived on the West Side and she was a promoter for him. She ended up writing um, uh, Heartbreak Hotel for him. Uh, she said, I'm gonna write you your first million dollar hit, your first number one hit. And uh, she ended up writing uh, Heartbreak Hotel based on a story about a suicide that she had read about. And uh, she actually lived here in this house in, on, on Delwood Avenue on the west side. This house is where Heartbreak Hotel was written. And it also the demo was recorded in the living room of this house. 
So there's some real history there. Ray Charles, of course, Ennis mentioned he lived here for a brief time, about a, a year and a half, two years. Uh, he lived, he came here from St. Augustine School of the Deaf and Blind. Uh, he stayed with family uh, friends on uh, West Church Street. Uh, the, the, the exact space where the house stood is underneath what is now La Villa School of the Arts, uh, where, where Church Street is cut off now at La Villa School of the Arts. That was the home that he lived in. Uh, he lived very close to um, about two blocks from the Clara White Mission, which also on the third floor housed the, the local musicians union, the American Federation of Musicians. And that, this was the, 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 the colored musicians union at that time. And he learned how to walk it on his own, uh, how many steps to take and when to take his right turns. And, uh, and he would walk from the house to the union all by himself. Um, lastly here, I hope I'm not going over time, but uh, you know, this all culminates into what becomes Southern rock really. And um, uh, a very sort of diverse taste of music all culminating into a sound. Uh, the Allman Brothers Band here really probably most people would agree is the band that really started the southern rock genre even though they fought against it all the time they thought when they were a rock band from the south it was redundant to say southern rock um they didn't really like the title uh but a lot of it started with Dwayne allman uh who uh the allman brothers greg and Dwayne, they, they they they're from nashville they spent a lot of time in daytona and uh down there they were listening to a station out of nashville that had like fifty thousand watts a lot of reception parts of Canada even got this music. And it was a station, the WLAC, and they were playing like basically race music or race records at the time, it was black music. And uh, all these white kids were hearing it and they were heavily influenced all on the east side of uh, North America and up into Canada. Ba bands like The Band and Robbie Robertson, they were influenced by the same station. Um, and uh, they wanted to play this kind of music. So, you know, in Daytona, they formed a band called the Almond Joys. Uh, later, they were the Hourglass. They went out to LA and were playing kind of a psychedelic sound that they hated. So Dwayne came back. He started uh, recording as a session man with uh, Aretha Franklin here at the piano. Uh, this was all at Muscle Shoals. Uh, he got the nickname Sky Dog from uh, this gentleman here, Wilson Pickett. Uh, they recorded um, they recorded uh, uh, a version of the Beatles' Hey Jude and Dwayne's solos all over the end of it. It was really kind of unheard of for like an R&B record or soul record. Uh, Pickett wasn't fully on board, but you know, when it was finished, he thought, oh, this is fantastic. So you know, that caught the ear of Eric Clapton uh, and they formed a friendship and, and Dwayne Allman played all over his album, uh, Layla. And um, he, he eventually ended up back here in Jacksonville and here we are at the Gray House uh, in Riverside, this is 2844 Riverside uh, Avenue, uh, March 23rd, 1969. A lot of the guys in the band were playing, living in this house, crashing here and there, and uh, they would jam in the living room. And this is where the infamous Jacksonville jam that a lot of people talk about happened in this house. Uh, on that day, they all got together. They made some real magical music together. And Dwayne apparently held the door shut and said, if you're not joining this band, you're gonna have to fight your way out of here. He called his brother, Greg, who was still in LA. By the 26th of March, uh, Greg was on the front porch and uh, started you know, banging some tunes together and, and some things that he was working on in LA. And this is really where it all started. And this marker went up uh, March 2019 for the 50th anniversary, that marker went up at the Gray House. So there's a lot of interesting historic sites musically here in Jacksonville. This is just the tip of the iceberg. And, and um, so again, if you go to jackshistory.org, we're, we're constantly researching, putting up new information, cool programming, uh, leading up to the opening of this, uh, of this uh, museum that, that, that we hope to open and uh, at the Casket Factory. So I really, I thank you for your time. I'll leave you with this quote uh, by Ray Charles. It really gets to the heart of what the blues is all about. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mitch. That was very informative. And so on along that lines of Jacksonville being this, this place where many were able to craft a career uh, based on the environment around here, I want to introduce you to our second panelist, Warner Singleton. Uh, he is on the executive board of directors for the Durkeville Historical Society. Uh, Mr. Singleton is a graduate of the first class of New Stanton Senior High School and a fellow Florida A&M University graduate, like myself plug myself there. Uh, he's also a military veteran and holds a master's degree in bilingual studies. After a long fulfilling career in the pharmaceutical uh, field, as well as 
chemistry, as being a chemistry, biology, and physics teacher, Mr. Singleton is the CEO of War Scene Music, which secures, publishes, and renews all the copyrights of his famous father, Jacksonville composer Charlie Hall Singleton. So I'd like to welcome you, uh, Mr. Singleton. Hello, and uh, good afternoon, now, I guess, to everybody. I noticed most of you guys had PowerPoints. Uh, Jesse, I think that uh, when you told Pam, my, my daughter, about this, we, at this particular time, we weren't able, you know, to uh, to put something like that together. But I have my notes here, and uh, we want to speak a little bit about that, Charlie Hall Singleton. I noticed that uh, when you uh, came on, you showed uh, Willis Smith Drugstore, and one of the famous pictures that he had uh, that I gave to go to be documented was the one him standing by uh, with a Smith drugstore uh, with his draped pants on. Uh, I'll start with a brief biological sketch of Charlie Horace Singleton. He was born September 17, uh, 1913 in Gainesville, Florida, Jetty's Quarters. He was a 1935 graduate of Old Stanton High School and the vice president of class. He resided at, on the north side of Jacksonville, 719 Clay Street, right across the street from Old Stanton High School. Uh, during his senior year and after graduation, Dad sang, danced, and produced shows uh, on the stage <coughs> at, at, New, at Old Stanton High School. The shows were local, was a local extravaganza featuring the area's best black singers, dancers, musicians, and comics called the April Follies, which was renamed to the 20th Century Review later. This event was hailed as the greatest annual social event for blacks in Jacksonville at that time and for the nearby student, uh, excuse me, citizen black. They all came dressed in their their finest and strutted their stuff. The event grew and had to move to a larger venue. The larger venue wound up being the Jacksonville Ballpark, renamed now to J.P. Small Ballpark. In 1950, Dad was encouraged by E.L. Harris to leave Jacksonville and seek a, a career as a composer in New York City. He left with a portfolio of, of lyrics and rhythms and tools for his success. He had immediate success by obtaining a position as a staff writer with Decca Records, later with Fisher Music Company, and finally with Roosevelt Music Company, 1650 Broadway, where my checks came from when I was at Florida and <laughs> uh, he, uh, notables at, 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 at that company were Bert Kemper, Bert Bacher, uh, Bacharach, Hal David, uh, and, and, and Bert Kemper. Uh, Eddie Snyder, Hal Fine, all these people were his associates while he was there. Uh, he started out writing R&B, had a big hit called Mama You Treat Your Daughter Me. Uh, by Ruth Brown, uh, at least Ruth Brown was a, you know, a singer. Okay. Later on, Hal David convinced dad to switch from R&B to pop. The change to pop was the beginning of his most celebrated and recorded compositions. The transition to pop led to writing songs for Nat King Cole, Frank Sinatra, Pat Boone, Wayne Newton, Andy Williams, uh, Johnny Mathis, Jack Jones, Al Martino, of course, Ruth Brown, B.B. King, Eric Clapton, Lou Rawls, Joe Williams, and many others. During his writing career, he was instrumental in the discovery of 
certain other individuals, such as Sam and Dave, the Five Keys, Dakota Staten, Nell Carter, uh, Neil Diamond, Jimmy Ricks from the Ravens, of course, Little Willie John, Vic Maybell, and Billy Daniels. The most notable songs of R&B and so forth were first, like I told you before, Mama, You Treat Your Daughter Mean. Nat King Cole was If I May, Send For Me. And then he went on and Jack Jones uh, did Lady, I'm In Love With You. Spanish Eyes by Al Martino. And finally, Strangers in the Night by Nat King Cole. One of the recent ones was B.B. King and Eric Clapton doing Help the Poor and Person to Person. Uh, BMI sent achievement plaques and letters and awards to me for dad's work for over a million performances of Strangers in the Night, Spanish Eyes, Lady, Don't Forbid Me, and Just As Much As Ever, and If I May. The song Strangers in the Night was featured in a movie called A Man Could Get Killed. In 1966, Grammy, Strangers, 1966 Golden Globe Award, Strangers, 1966 Record of the Year, 1966 Record of the Year, okay, Song of the Year, Best Pop, Best Engineered Record, Spanish Eyes receives 100, uh, 100 of century, 100 of the century. Uh, basically, you know, without the pictures and all the other stuff there, that was the best that I could put together for you right now. Uh, my daughter and I are gonna put together a collage of uh, 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 PowerPoint. I do have pictures of him uh, when, when he first started out with his, you know, the first band that they had. And uh, I used to, <laughs> was a little boy, I used to go up there to stand to see him do this uh, this show there. Everybody turned out for this. The April Fallers was the biggest thing that Jacksonville could know for black people. And like I said, they turned out with their best duds on. Uh, they talked about, it. speaking about Ashton Street, they used to call him the King Asher Street. My dad used to go up on Asher Street in a convertible Cadillac and throw dollars up in the air. And people were, <laughs> and, and everybody would, here comes out of the hall, so he's the boss, you know? Uh, it was a great thing up there. Joe Higdon, Joe Higdon, and uh, my dad were the best of friends. Uh, I know when I first started playing saxophone uh, at the, uh, at Stanton, I used to go over and talk to Joe Higdon and he'd give me reads and all kinds of stuff like that. And uh, we would talk, but uh, I look at that place now, it's Clara White Mission and all that. But I used to, <laughs> I used to uh, be up there all the time on Ashley Street with him doing this, doing that. And the other, I was a little boy tagging on with him, you know. But uh, he was quite a character. There's a, probably a lot more that I could say, say about him, you know, you know, if I was asked a question, I guess you could say. But basically, this is it. And when, when I, even when, when I went up to New York, you know, when I graduated from Florida A&M and I went up to, <laughs> I went up to New York, man, I didn't know all these people, you told me, they used to have a place <clears throat> up there, it was a bar. And I went in that bar and, with him and everybody who was big was in there, all these big saxophone players, all these, you know, uh, vocalists and all of them were there. You know, I said, well, when are we going to the office? He said, this is the office. This is where we exchange ideas. This is where we write stuff down on a napkin and, and, and give it to each other and ask each other, uh, you know, what is going on, you know, and what should I do and how did this sound and all that other kind of thing. But anyway, 
to make a long story short, okay, that's basically, uh, in a nutshell, my father. We, we really appreciate that. That's a lot of information I know I did not know uh, that we will certainly uh, find a way to promote and tell that rich history of La Villa and, and Ashley Street and its contributions uh, to that scene. Uh, so I, I want to go ahead and introduce our third panelist, uh, Tony Steve. Uh, Professor Steve is an artist in residence, uh, contemporary and world music at Jacksonville University. He is a graduate of Jacksonville University with a Bachelor of Music degree, and he also has a Master of Music degree from Ithaca College, where he now he currently teaches uh, the person in composition. He has performed with the Jacksonville Symphony as a percussionist and toured with a chorus line in Europe and appeared on numerous uh, recordings um, as a recording artist. So at this time, I want to introduce uh, Professor Steve. Thank you. Thanks, Ennis. Uh, I was tasked with uh, talking about contemporary music in Jacksonville, and it's it's a it's an interesting topic. Uh, Often it's called new music. Uh, and instead of going the track of taking on jazz and everything, I just thought I would take on, I took on just this small niche market of contemporary or new classical music. Uh, so there have been some trends and we'll start at the 70s. So during the 70s, the emphasis in this type of music was placed on electronic music and that came directly in this area. A lot of that came directly from Jacksonville University. During this time at JU, back to Delius, the, the, the College of Fine Arts sponsored the Delius Festival of Contemporary Music. Each year or every other year, composers would submit new works for performance at the festival. Often, this music was composed in the style of music from 19, the post-1945 Europeans. And uh, that meant the music came from a world bent on the destruction of traditional practice harmony. And frankly, that music is often very difficult for listeners. This music was being performed on college campuses in this area and across the country. And it had to be very kind, it had a small following, but a following. During the 1980s, uh, the music from the, the Academy had its first serious competition in the guise of what is called neo-romantic music. And it is a reaction to that post-1945 music. Jacksonville actually benefited from this consonant style of composition. During this period, Roger Nirenberg was the music director of the Jacksonville Symphony, and he was responsible for commissioning new works for orchestra out of this style. He commissioned composers such as Richard Daniel Poor, J. Allen Kernis, and Stephen Albert, and these were premiered by the symphony during the 80s. During the 80s, 90s, and the early 2000s, uh, one person, and I'm going to give some biographies of this, but uh, Charlotte Mabry was presenting series of concerts of new music when she was the professor of percussion at the University of North Florida. And she would present exciting and thought provoking music for percussion and pieces that had a lot of music, theater pieces, which allowed for improvisation between the percussionist and also spoken word, which was a part of that uh, change in the genre. Uh, in the end, the future of contemporary music in Jacksonville looks bright, but composers, musicians are going to need to keep pushing forward and they're going to have to keep engaging the audiences of the area. There are some models for this out there, most notably uh, a festival out of New York called Bang on a Can. And Part of this takes on having a more commercialized approach to getting new music out to people. So with that said, I'm going to look at the past. There are three people. One is a fellow named William Hoskins. He was a, a composer and professor 
with Jacksonville University. He created Jacksonville's first electronic music studio. He worked with Bob Moog of Moog Synthesizers to create and build the first original electronic music studio in Jacksonville. He put out uh, an, a few records, but his most important record was a, a, a had a piece called Galactic Fantasy, and these are really hard to get, so I, I, I don't have a recording of them. You can find them online, and I will send you all some links to that. I may have already, I'm not certain. And then another piece called Ref Eastern Reflections, a suite for imaginary orchestra. And in the Eastern Reflections, Dr. Hoskins recreated a gamelan orchestra as well as electronic sounds as he uh, pushed this electronic music that was very new at the time forward. And it was very, very new to Jackson. So Dr. Hoskins was one of the innovators of the past in Jacksonville contemporary music history. Uh, finally, uh, or next, I get to Charlotte Mavery. She became the catalyst for new music when she arrived in Jacksonville in 1977. She was one of the very few female principal percussionists in the country, and she taught numerous students in the area and pushed the idea of contemporary music. So she was an innovator in this area. Uh, as it, she was basically a one person crew pushing new music in Jacksonville. She's still doing this today in 2021 and she's working with a contemporary ensemble here in town that I'll speak to later. Uh, and then there's a crossover and that's what uh, the next two people I'll speak to. And is one of them is a, a fellow named Bill Boston, who's a Jacksonville University graduate. And he's a composer and an orchestrator. And he has over 60 film orchestration and scoring credits on his resume. Some of the films he's orchestrated were nominated for Academy Awards, The 310 to Yuma and The Hurt Locker. And if you go to his IMDb, you'll also see orchestrations that he worked on for movies such as Under the Tuscan Sun, The Day After Tomorrow, Terminator 3, Rise of the Robots, to name just a few. He's currently back in Jacksonville and he's teaching orchestration online for York University in the UK. Uh, orchestrators have to be versed in numerous styles. In fact, myriad styles would be a better way to put it. Uh, Bill can write in the style of a pop artist, or he can immediately turn around and write in the style of Christoph Pendarecki or, or someone like John Cage. He can do all of that. As we look at that, Bill is a crossover to what we would say is the present and the future of contemporary music in Jacksonville. Jonah Pierre, I think, bridges the worlds together. He is a, a young lion on the Jacksonville music scene, and he's been experimenting and making musical art since he was in high school at Douglas Anderson School of the Arts. Jonah went and studied English literature at the Oberlin College and Conservatory, and he returned to Jacksonville after graduation. The worlds he lives in, he's he, worlds he lives in would cross over. It's, it's amazing. That's the best way to put it about Jonah. He works in the worlds of Latin, jazz, pop, and electronica, and I'm sure others that are yet to be determined. He's primarily known as a pianist at this point, but he's equally comfortable playing many many percussion instruments at a very high level. Um, his skills as an improviser in nu numerous musical genres makes Jonah a bright spot on the Jacksonville and the regional music scene. To hear what he's doing as a leader of his own, you can hear him at uh, Buchner's Beer, Beer Hall in the Murray Hill area the first Thursday of each month. And this is primarily his electronica music. Uh, another group in Jacksonville that's making a, a good name for themselves and pushing boundaries and 
engaging audiences is the Bold City Contemporary Ensemble. They've been making leaps with commissions and collaborating with local, national, and international composers. And the group has had a wonderful collaboration with the Museum of Contemporary Art downtown. They have a strong online presence and they've been recording music from composers from all walks of life. And finally, uh, another group that surprisingly, I say that in the kindest of terms, and I mean that, is the Jacksonville Symphony. And the symphony, although it's a traditional orchestra, they're really working hard on moving the needle forward with contemporary music. Recently, they've had Courtney Bryan uh, serving as a composer in residence from 2018 to 2020 as the Mary Patton Carr composer in residence. And she's from New Orleans and a wonderful up and coming composer that's doing great things at this point. And then, uh, Right now, the orchestra has recently commissioned five new works from composers of all walks of life, and they have that coming up for the new season. Uh, they've had in the past a competition called Fresh Ink for Florida Composers, and uh, the, what led up to this Courtney Bryan composer in residence would have been uh, their most recent festival for new orchestral pieces called Earshot, where they had five up and coming composers and those composers were able to get their music heard by the public. And it's very difficult for orchestra pieces to get heard, new pieces like that. So Jacksonville has been doing quite a bit in this realm. Uh, I feel like they're move it's moving forward. There was over the years, some ebbs and flows, but I think that it's moving forward and it's it's going to be a bright spot again. Thank you. All right. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, we are actually right on <laughs> right at one o'clock. So, but we do have uh, one question in the Q and A box. I'm going to ask all three of you and just kind of get your input here. Uh, the question is, are there top quality recording studios that attract musicians to Jacksonville today? Uh, I'll answer that, I guess, or I'll chime in. That's a hard call. Probably the answer would be there are recording studios in town, and I don't want to disparage them, but I don't think that there's any one studio that's has a draw on it. Uh, like uh, Mitch was talking about with uh, the Allman brothers and Dwayne Allman and his relationship with uh, Eric Clapton, you know, people were going to Miami and doing a lot of things at Criteria Student Studios in those times or people in Muscle Shoals. Jacksonville just doesn't have that right now, but there's a lot of, a lot of people doing a lot of good recording. But a lot of that I think is because of the digital explosion, you can just do it at home. All right, let's see. I don't see any other comments that have not been answered. So it is one o'clock and I know we just close out at one o'clock. So uh, in closing, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this event was the third of six virtual discussions uh, this year of the Jacksonville History and Heritage Series. It's co-produced by the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund and uh, myself for the Jacksonville Magazine. Our fourth virtual event will be hosted on September the 17th, and the topic will revolve around Jacksonville's changing demographics and its multicultural history. So we love to have you join us. So stay tuned for more details by following the Jackson Mag at Facebook, um, Instagram, or on Twitter, or the website, thejacksonmag.com. So in closing, I want to thank all our panelists and all our guests for taking the time today to spend uh, your lunch hour with us. All right. Have a good day. Thank you.